Hi, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. And I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Tonight's forum, tonight's format is an open forum. So this is really an opportunity for you to ask any question you would like uh, that's relevant to the program and to the, to the work that we do, um, but also to invite family and friends to these as we go forward. You can also invite siblings, anybody close to you who you think might benefit from having extra support, because if we can support them, then they can better support you. Uh, I've talked about this so many times over the years with, with parents where well-intending family members were, were reaching out to them, but really they ended up taking from them and not giving the, to them as much, not really offering them the kind of support that they needed. And they found themselves, for example, needing to give updates or feeling obligated to give updates to, to extended family. And the family was asking for this in the spirit of providing support, but it was really a taking thing. So this is our way of helping them to help you. You can ask a question for them. You can ask a question about them. You can ask a question that you've been asked and see how I might answer the question. So today's May 5th, 2020. Welcome to the broadcast. And you can submit those questions at any time. We have a handful of pre-submitted and some of you have already submitted some questions. So thanks for being here. This was actually sent to my, to my website. I changed a lot of the data so that it was not necessarily the exact same question, but the essence of it is the same. Somebody wrote to me, our son was unwilling, unwillingly transported from marijuana addiction to treatment just prior to his 18th birthday. While there, trauma was also addressed due to his being abused. His entire life changed, thus the marijuana daily usage. He was also an honor roll student. He is now at risk for not graduating from high school. He was and is extremely disrespectful and refuses any and all boundaries that were in place when he came home. He fooled everyone while in treatment. He, he has relapsed. At 18, he is having, is having him leave our home, our best option. My partner and I go to counseling and I attend CODA, Codependence Anonymous. Asking him to leave has been the popular advice for us. What are your thoughts? Well, this will be the third time that I tell this story today, but now it's being recorded so more people can listen to it. Um, first and foremost, it's very important for you to understand that nobody can make this decision but you. And while there might be popular opinions, this is something that you have to live with. The, the real important aspect of considering a, a question like this, which is a boundary, and this is a significant one, is finding out your own participation in the issue, finding out how you're mixed up in it all. That's the important question. You know, I, I talk I talk about this idea that of, of codependency and recovery from codependency. And codependency is a pop psychology term. It's not a clinical term. It's not used in, in the in the clinical diagnostic manual, but it's a pop psychology term, which really just suggests an inability to understand how to be a person and how to relate to people that we love and care about, especially those that are struggling. So it's about becoming a person, becoming a human, and becoming connected to other people while not feeling the need to compromise oneself or sacrifice oneself. There's a lot more uh, aspects that go into that definition. I, I've done several podcasts on that, but the real issue for any parent, this could be about a marriage, this could be about another boundary with the child, is you've got to figure you out. And then out of that figuring out comes your truth or your decision. I was challenged on a, a recent talk that I was given by a professional, by a therapist who said, Brad, how can you suggest to a parent that they kick their addicted child out of the home when that could possibly result in death? That's the same question that this parent is asking me. And I said, I was giving a talk at a conference. I said, uh, you may have misunderstood me or I, I misspoke. I'm not sure, but I would never tell a parent what to do. I would never be inclined to tell a parent what to do in a situation like this. The burden is too great to bear. The risks are too great. In fact, if you look at the ethical guidelines for most licensing in most states and for mental health professionals, it is explicit that we not give advice in major life decisions. And this would be a major life decision. So my job is to help you unravel the thinking. If you're thinking in terms of cause and effect, 
I'm going to challenge that. If you're thinking you have to find or discover or engineer this perfect response or, or intervention that guarantees that your child will turn out the way that you want, I'm going to challenge that. If it comes from a place of self-care and truth and authenticity and love and courage, then whatever you do will work. If it comes from a place of fear, it's almost impossible to get right. So I know what the book says. I know that the default answer is that parents without boundaries create addicted children. I know that's what you get taught. It's not explicitly said that way, but it's implied at least. And it's simply not true. The only thing that will that is guaranteed to be fixed if you if you heal your codependency is your codependency. In fact, the thinking, the cause and effect thinking that is often implied in parent education that your bad boundaries cause an addiction is codependency itself. So you can't use codependency thinking to fix codependency thinking. You have to change it altogether. So you operate from a place of truth. I've said to a couple of different families today this idea that what if you could embrace the idea that you can't control for outcomes, that you couldn't guarantee an outcome? What would your choice be? And one of the parents said to me today, well, that's just a coin flip then. And my response is, exactly. Once you remove cause and effect thinking, once you remove codependent thinking, you're lost. When I, when I brought my son home after about five or six months away, when he was 13, he turned 14, I was getting some recommendations that his treatment should, should be longer. And I, I said, I'm happy to hear that. Give me the reasoning. And the response from the professionals was, well, he's not done yet. And I said, of course he's not done. He's 14. How could he be done? And if, I, if I'm waiting for him to be done... I'm probably going to have to wait until his prefrontal cortex comes in, until his whole brain is developed. And that's around the age of 25, and I'm not willing to do that. And as they recommended conservative, understandably conservative recommendations, and I asked them their reasoning, I said, you keep giving me advice, recommendations, based on on a kind of thinking that I don't even believe in. And I'm ready, ready for the work. And he came home and we had some great times. We had some difficult times. We, we, we were on the verge of another treatment a couple of years later, but, but the communication was open. I had it in my back pocket, right? It was, I had a plan B in place. And, and around that time, he got himself sober and hasn't had a drink in 11 years. Graduated with a master's degree this week lives a fulfilling, thriving life, published his own book on art, does stand-up comedy for fun, started his own business and made a a decent amount of money for a young person, bought his own house, lives a full, rich life. the, The thinking isn't that you can figure out. If you lack boundaries, right, if that's a, a characteristic of your parenting or your personhood, That's just the symptom. And so therapists who encourage boundaries, they're just dealing with the surface. Boundaries are important to talk about and consider. But why don't you have boundaries? Why why do you struggle with boundaries? Where's that wound? What was it from your family of origin? If I talk to you in three or four or five years and I ask you how you're doing, And you give me one or two sentences about your child. And then you go on to talk about how you're doing with your therapy, with your recovery, with your mindfulness practice, with your exercise, with your triggers, with your awareness. Then I know you're doing your work. But if I ask you how you're doing and you talk a long time about how your child is doing with great detail, then I know that the focus is is off, right? It's, It's on your child. Your child is now determining your serenity. So I don't know what you should do. 
I can talk to you about the thinking. I wrote a couple of books on the thinking. The podcast that we have around the thinking, I, I can talk to you about that. If you're my client, I can walk you through it in a very slow and patient way over a period of many sessions. But how could I possibly know what you should do? How could I poss- How could anybody possibly know what you should do? The very notion that somebody believes that they know what you should do is itself a problem in this whole process. And if you're hanging out with people who think that you should know, they, they know what you should do, you might want to find some new people. They can give recommendations based on practices and principles, but it's it's your life, and most importantly, it's your life with a person that you love more than anybody else on the planet. Someone says, speak to a child returning home, returning to home versus going to another program. It seems like a very high percentage of kids don't come home. You know, when I first started in wilderness therapy in 1996, my default, my theoretical inclination was that people, that, that, that students, that, that our clients should go home after a really powerful, creative, dynamic intervention, which wilderness therapy is. And especially based on the amazing progress I was able to observe in those early days and months, I was like, give them a chance. That took about eight months for me to figure out that by the time that, that families, that children got to this point, that it needed a more significant redirection to kind of shift the patterns. It just practically didn't turn out the way that we wanted. And so I was theoretically inclined that people should go home afterwards. I became experientially biased that that often wasn't the course that people found to be the most beneficial for them. So it's, you know, I've been talking about it already. It's, it's partly based on your work. I've told this story many times. My firstborn son, when he was 19 years old, was going away for a couple of years. And I was grieving and sad in anticipation. And he was going to do something that he wanted to do. It wasn't a treatment issue. He was going, to, going on a service mission. And I was devastated, heartbroken. And my therapist said in, in a session just leading up to this, she said, First of all, he knows that you love him and that gave me some comfort. And then she said, and he needs to get as far away from you as he can. And all of my pain disappeared because I realized I could do that for him. I could give him the gift of going away. My 18 year old son now, who got accepted to the college of his choice right outside of New York City, he may or may not be able to go based on what's going on in the world today with COVID. Um, but I want to go to New York and and live and I want to teach at the university that he got accepted to. I wanted to before he got accepted. But we made a decision as a family that if he got accepted and chose to go there, I'm not going to teach there while he's there, at least for the first couple of years and then we'll we'll recalibrate. I told him the same thing. And he he said, I I love you. And at first I was going to say yes, but yeah, I need to get away. And not, not all of these children are 18, but... What happens with these issues developmentally is they're saying the system doesn't work. And so our inclination to to recommend aftercare is based on this idea that oftentimes when it gets to this point, it's evidence that the child is saying the system isn't working for me and I I need something else. And just like I said with this first question, you know, I'll I'll be open to to talk about it with you, to work you, to talk you through the, the thinking But experience has shown me, students and clients have told me, families have told me that longer care often is beneficial to get them all ready, all in a place where they're able to be successful for whatever happens after Evoke. And if the child is 18 or older, that most often isn't going back home to the same system, to the same setting. So... Someone says, another related question, I am struggling transitioning my son from Evoke to aftercare, especially without coming home. Yes, this needs to occur, but is there anything you can say to help with this? (laughs) When I was moving my son from wilderness, he went there for 16 weeks. 
Uh, I had a really good discount, by the way, because uh, I own the program. But um, we are moving him from, from wilderness to a therapeutic school. And I had taught about the vulnerability that exists between these programs, even with students who have done as, as well as any. Um, I talked about the vulnerability. I remember when I was in Woodshop in seventh grade. You know, all, all we can make in seventh grade for most of us, except for the really talented kids, was a breadboard, right? You glue a bunch of different kinds of wood together and you cut it and you, you, you sand it down and you make a breadboard. You got yourself a, a Mother's Day present, right? And I remember Mr. Diedrich was his name. I hadn't thought of that name until just now. Mr. Diedrich was our woodshop teacher in Irvine, California. And um, Mr. Diedrich had a, a, a breadboard that he had glued days before. And he said, I want to show you guys something. And he broke it over his knee along the, the, the parallel of the wood that was glued together. He said, if it breaks in the middle of the wood, I've done a good job. If it breaks where there was glue or a seam or a, a transition, I've not done a good job. You know, at the time, at seventh grade, I guess, what's that, 13, 14 years old? That's a long time ago. I thought it was an interesting, fun moment in Woodshop. But I obviously haven't, I, I remember almost nothing else from seventh grade except for this moment with this breadboard, with this, this illustration of seams and transitions and the vulnerability and the weakness that exists there. And I thought about that with regard to transitioning. Make your visits before or after the transition. Transition is the most vulnerable time. I was telling the story when I was dropping my son off at the therapeutic school, I got so emotional. He wasn't trying to manipulate. He wasn't asking to come home. It wasn't a negotiation. I was so emotional and trying to hold it back that I felt like all the blood vessels in my eyes were going to burst because of all the pressure. And my son had to turn to me and say, Dad, I'll be okay. I'll be okay. And, and, and I was devastated. It's a vulnerable time. So if you're making this step, our recommendation is you make it as seamless as possible. And, and using the illustration from Mr. Diedrich's uh, woodshop class in Irvine, California, when I was 14 years old, 13 years old, seams are vulnerable. Somebody says, I'm having a hard time keeping up with all the parent assignments. Are some more important than others? Oh, great question. It's a smorgasbord. It's a buffet. Don't think of it as a menu where you have to eat. Um, talk to your therapist about that, but but it's too much. If you do everything, most of you, if you do everything, you have other children, you have full-time jobs, you have lots of things to do, you won't be able to do it. So balance self-care. We want to give you enough support um, that you do it, but we don't want to overwhelm you. I think the, the book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent, is would be a priority for, for me. I mean, I, I wrote it as kind of a manual for this process that we're all going through. So that would be a, a priority. But it's case by case. It's not all the same. And please take some pressure off yourself uh, with the idea that you think you need to do everything. We don't mean that. And we're sorry that it might come across that way. We just wanted to give you enough. Look through the podcast. Look at the subjects that jump out to you, the ones that you have questions about. Prioritize the very specific tailored assignments that your child's therapist gives to you. And then of the others, pick and choose what fits for you. And know that we have too much content. We have live webinars. We have parent support groups. We have hundreds uh, of webinars and podcasts in our archive library. We have books, letters, writing assignments, Al-Anon, therapy at home. It's a lot. I, I haven't noticed the difference between parents who are spending equal amounts of time in various areas. Like some are reading more, some are listening more, some are attending more meetings. Those are all about the same. I can tell the difference between somebody who's putting no time in except for the phone calls with me week to week versus the one who's spending two or three hours doing something else. So spend two or three hours a week, a few hours a week doing something else that's from this buffet of, of resources and support that we've offered you. 
Someone says our son has been in a vote since seven weeks ago. I'm struggling because I feel very dependent on the way he's doing. I follow all your and the therapist's advices, and I'm reading your book and webinar. But this internal shift you talk about is far from how I really feel. How can I break my core belief? My, my firm core belief. First of all, you're doing it. You know, this is a pretty good um, attendance list tonight. Um, it's a, a lot of people showed up tonight. So if you showed up tonight, you're doing the work. The stuff that I talked to you about has taken me 21 years of therapy to get to. Um, and although we might not have a personal one-on-one -on -one relationship, I want you to know I'm, I'm patient. It's taken me a lifetime to figure this stuff out. And some of it I figured out academically and intellectually long before I figured it out emotionally, and some I'm still figuring out. So I, I'm just trying to give you an idea about what it looks like and sounds like. Just keep listening. The, there, are, there are people that attend these or, or my meetings or my group or my lectures, and they'll say to me, I didn't have any idea what you were talking about. It was like you were talking Greek to me in the early days. And now all of it makes sense. And later on they say, um, you know, I have your voice in my head. The same thing I have, in, I have my therapist's voice in my head. So you, 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 my idea with all of this is to expose you to a, a different kind of sensibility than the one you were exposed to growing up from your parents and, and the dominant culture of your upbringing, the, the sensibility that I was not exposed to. It's a different way of being. It's a different way of thinking about being alive and in relationship to our children and those we love. But it takes a long time. And after a while, you're gonna to wanna to find people that you can relate to because the old conversations, the old people, you still love them, but it doesn't make sense to have the old conversations. So just keep coming. Keep listening, keep reading, you know, stick with what is resonating with you, even if it doesn't all make sense and come together, and you'll get there. It takes a long time. I was in Chicago in, in November. We were hosting a, a parent support group, and this father came. It was a large circle, and this father came, and he had this book that was worn out, and it had all these, a book of mine that was worn out and had all these tabs to it. And he said at one point during the meeting, you know, thank you. The work has been great, great for our daughter. Every bit is great, maybe even greater for us as parents. But this takes years. And I said to him, thank you for saying that. Thank you for reminding everybody here. It takes years. So be patient with yourself. It's important. It's necessary to be patient with yourself to be able to continue with the work. And you're being taught uh exposed to for most of you i would argue the same almost everybody a completely contrary way of thinking and being someone says for parent assignments how can we attend the parent support group meet parent support groups during the pandemic <laughs> during the pandemic how can we attend parent support groups well since you ask we have them online. So we have one tomorrow. Uh, that says Thursday, May 6th, Malia. That's a typo on my part. Um, is it May 7th, Thursday, or Wednesday, May 6th? Anyway, Malia will tell us in just a second. But um, uh, we have online parent support groups. We have parent support groups. Um, we have support groups, excuse me, for our intensive program. So it's tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So get there early. Um, we allow for about 15 people to, to join. And we're going to be doing these um, four times a month from here on out, long after COVID. We actually planned on doing this before COVID. And it just happened to coincide with COVID. So we were, we were ready right away. We started them right away. I had been assigned to set them up in December. And I had procrastinate, procrastinated. So I apologize. But they're up and running. Do you expect to start in-person intensives for the parents anytime soon? I don't know. We haven't canceled June. 
or July or August. Um, I, I don't know. We're going to listen to the CDC. We're going to follow uh, the council from, from our, our leaders, and we're going to take a conservative, safe response. My, my daughter is the lead staff at the intensives, and I have been working a, a great deal of them, and we are going to be operating some of those in, in June, July, and August. And I have a compromised immune system, so we're going to take a conservative approach and not expose ourselves or those people that might be traveling to them. I, I will tell you this. I believe this strongly. The online ones are much better than I thought. In fact, um, in some ways, I think there are advantages. We have one or two openings for our May 15th intensive. Those will probably be gone in the next two days. So I would strongly encourage it. I, I wouldn't endorse it if I didn't believe in it or have the experience. We're having a second online one this weekend. So it's a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper, because uh, the overhead is less and you don't have to travel. <clears throat> and you can do it over a weekend. Um, so if you're, if you're able to, May 15th through 17th is going to book up in the next couple of days for sure. Um, I would strongly encourage it. And we're just taking the other one, you know, one week at a time, the in-person one. Someone says, can you talk about how much a part of the child's life, the wellness experience will be a week after leaving a month, a year? I can't speak to the specific child. Um, what I can tell you is that 25% of our, our field guides at any given point are former students. I will tell you that about 80% of our students orally promise that they're going to become a field guide. They don't all follow through, of course, but many of them find themselves there. Many of them find the, the peace and the mindfulness that comes from being in the Willis. You know, when we started, when I started in Willis therapy in 1996, there was no such thing as a smartphone. And, and while screen time and electronics were, were becoming an issue, they were no, nowhere near the issue. And now the, the digital detox that is a part of a wilderness program is profound and central. You know, and technology is not all bad. If it wasn't for technology, we couldn't be doing this right here, right now. You couldn't be watching or listening to this podcast. We couldn't be having Zoom calls. I couldn't be running an intensive this weekend. So it's not all negative, but um, returning to nature is for many people an important part of the healing process. It's one of the things that students attribute to, to the change. So I can't speak for sure, but it is, it tends to, in our experience, have a very large impact on young people who attend our program. Someone says, can you recommend how to incorporate both parents in the recovery and healing process for a child? What if only one parent is totally on board? If one parent is totally on board, you're, you're, you're fighting a fight with a hand tied behind your back. You can still win. It's just going to take more work. I did a, a, a podcast webinar on co-parenting where I talk about this. Don't get too distracted by the other parent's non-work. Commit to your work. Stay on your side of the street is what they say on Al-Anon. And yes, it's a disadvantage. And research shows us Research shows us that you don't need a bunch of people to see you growing up. You need one at least to see you for ideal outcomes. Just one makes a difference. So even if you're feeling hopeless, even if you know that there's a, a fight that you're fighting with a disadvantage, you can and will make a difference if you show up for your child in, a, in an authentic, clear, courageous, and loving way. Being able to contain and see them but first and foremost, being able to, to take care of yourself. So it's tough. It's hard. It's real. But don't get distracted. Otherwise, it will become about your issue. If you become obsessed with, which I have before, about what other people aren't doing, now you're the problem. Someone writes, as a grandmother, how can I support my daughter who is a single mother and her son is in a boat? Great question. Grandma... Do the work. Do some of the work. Learn. If you're attending tonight, do some of the work. Read the book. Listen to the podcasts. 
Um, go to a meeting with your daughter. Most importantly, listen to the podcast that I did um, a week ago, Monday, on challenging notions about what it means to be a good parent. That's one of the favorite ones that I've done of mine in a long, long time. So if you all are wondering which one to listen to, listen to that one. It's one that I worked on and prepped for, for for quite a while. So the best thing that we can do for, for our children who might have children out of oak is to do a little bit of the work and to understand. Don't think you've got to know everything and got to have all the answers. Provide them support. Ask them what they need and listen to the answer. And don't come in with some idea about what you think they ought to need or what you think they need and impose that on them. That's not okay. If my mother did that to me and she has, my response is, we're not going to talk then. Not because I'm mad, but because that's not what I need. If you can't show up with what I need, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk to somebody else. And then learn to probably the most courageous, profound thing that you could do, and this is a really, really tall task, is look at yourself. Just like we're asking your daughter to look at the dents that she caused her children, not from a place of shame or game or, or, or not from a place of shame or, or guilt or blame, but just from a place of awareness. Do the same thing. Listen to the podcast I did a week ago. Read the journey of the heroic parent and start to understand this, this thing about raising children and, 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 and being good at it is not about having it, the right answers or getting it perfect or getting it right. It's about being human and letting your child be themselves while still having clear boundaries for yourself that come from a place of self. So it's kind of a convoluted answer, but that's mine. Any ideas on getting a teenage sibling to possibly engage in their older brother in wilderness besides letters? Well, first of, first of all, it might not be their need right now. Sometimes they need to not be engaged with their brother. Sometimes it needs to not be about their brother. And so while you might have the desire and you might have some anxiety about their non-involvement, consider the possibility that they might not need it. You know, children, siblings of children who struggle often experience collateral damage, right? They experience neglect because the focus has to be on the child in crisis. They experience conflict and stress because of the fighting or the worry in, in the house. And sometimes the best thing they can do is to protect themselves and to kind of keep their own space. So make invitations, offer support, but know that they might need something different than what you think that they need. If they start acting out, great. You can make an invitation to, for them to go to therapy or an allotene group if that feels inappropriate, but be slow to impose your treatment plan on the sibling. And listen to them. And even put out there the idea like it might be important for you to protect yourself. It might be important for you to withdraw. It might be important for you not, to not write letters right now. See, a core feature of trauma, and we all know something about trauma right now because some part of it is happening to all of us right now during the pandemic. But a core feature of trauma is that something happened to you that was outside of your control. And so sometimes siblings might withdraw or, or pull back or shut down because they're trying to regain control. So listen to them, see them, understand them. And, and maybe, I'm not telling you, you you need to or you should, but maybe the best thing for them might to be a, li be a little bit less engaged. And you can frame that as them taking care of themselves. Someone says, my son has been in a boat for four weeks. He was somewhat destructive of property, but never violent towards people. Yet because of my own history, I was afraid of him and walked on eggshells. Suggestions on how I can shift this once he's home. Um, like all of us, you know, getting trauma for our, getting trauma, getting treatment for our trauma is important in parenting and, and, and being in a, a relationship as a couple. So 
go to therapy and work on your trauma so that because and I'm going to use this visually for those of you that are watching. You know, you, you take this this stuff that's out in front of you and you go over here to this other place to take care of it. Anger, trauma, fear, anxiety, you take care of it over there. So that when you come back here to the child, to the partner, you can be there in support of the, the child and the relationship. But if you don't take care of your trauma, you will ask your child consciously or unconsciously to take care of you. And they can't bear that burden gracefully. I've said recently that the psychological virus that plagues humankind is the idea that children are supposed to take care of parents. That a parent's serenity is a child's responsibility. That a parent's happiness and pride and fear and sadness and anger and frustration is a child's obligation and responsibility to carry. It's not, it's yours. You're in charge of taking care of you. I'm in charge of taking care of me. And if I am to support, to love, to, to show up to my family uh, the best way that I can, I make sure that I have a practice of taking care of me so that when I come back to the family, to the child, I can be there for them. Someone says, how can I help empower my son with his, with his step work when he is 16 and new to the step work recovery process? You know, do your work. Do your work. Do your 12-step work. Model it. Go to CODA. Go to Al-Anon. Uh, go to adult children. Do your work and model it. If you go to CODA or you go to Al-Anon, you will learn. They will tell you, stay on your side of the street. You know, work on your addiction, not his or hers. So just do your work and model it. And it'll, it's infectious. They'll, they'll not only see you doing it, they'll actually, they'll reap the benefits of your work. That's what our children do. They reap the benefits of our work. And by empowering him, you, you're given choice. You know, your job is to set boundaries. You might have ideas about what your children need to do, and those are interesting at best. But the real work is not figuring out what your child needs. The real work is figuring out what you need, what your truth is, and then operating from that place. We can become really, really obsessed with what our children need because we love them and that, that, that love tells us that we've got to figure it out. But really the, the thing is, it's just working on you, changing the project from them to you. That's the real work for all of us. And by the way, if you're wondering about outcomes, the outcomes of that shift are dramatic. Children whose parents shift the project from the child to the parent, they'll say to the parent, man, this is changing my life. It feels so different. Thank you. I can see the work that you're doing. But if it's always, what do they need? What do I have to do to them? That just, just feels like a burden. Just feels like something is wrong with them. Someone says, Grandma would like to write a letter, but can only write in Spanish. Does the vocab have translators? I don't think so. I know we don't formally. Um, you know, uh, talk, to, talk to your therapist. There might be a staff member. I know my son who works for a voc is fluent in both languages. And if it's, uh, I, could, I could contract him to do it. He works for us. He, do, he does some of our art and some of our media, but um, he's fluent in both languages. So if you, and he know and he's also been a field staff and a student, so he might know the language, but ask your therapist that evoke and see. You can also email me if there's no other, if there's no other options. My son, Jake might, might be willing to do that. Do kids who come back from wilderness tend to want to continue having wilderness experiences? Do you recommend trying to create those kind of outdoor experiences? It seems like a huge culture shock, returning from the wilderness to the regular world. How can we help with this transition? Some do and some don't. You know, it's, it's about asking them and seeing what they want. I remember when I wrote my first book, my mother-in-law, who's a teacher, for, was a, she's retired, but she was a teacher her entire career. And she was reading the book, actually in my living room, reading the book. And she's like, 
you know, you should teach teachers. You should go and lecture at schools about children and what children are being faced with today. And I said, well, if I lectured the teachers, which I have since then quite a few times, I wouldn't teach teachers about children. I would teach teachers how to listen. I mean, that's really what my books are, right? That's really what this is. It's learning how to listen and hear, learning to not be distracted by the symptom or the behavior, learning to see and hear the wound underneath, the need that's unexpressed underneath. So ask your child and listen to their answer and support them where, they, where, where you can. I, I think giving them the option is a great gift. Making the invitation or the offering is a fantastic gift generous gift, but you don't have to know in advance. You don't have to know whether they will do it. And, and learn to listen. Learn to listen to what they say. It's a great question. It's very generous of you to think about. And, and, and for some, it's a very important part of the process. And your willingness to be creative and to, to support with resources, that venture is fantastic. They can tell you. The transition is hard. You know, work with your therapist to find mentors which are becoming more popular, um, therapists for you, family therapists for you, finding therapeutic support services at home, including mentors, is, is what you can do to help with, with transition. But also just listening. The more work you do, the more you're going to be a resource to your child. I've been told that 65% of campers end up going to aftercare. That's about right. Is it possible that a child can come home first? and perhaps even be homeschooled. I'm considering hiring a retired teacher to homeschool. What traits would you have to see in a child to support his decision? It's always possible. Um, I look more to the parents. Well, I look to both the parent and the child. Um, like I said earlier in, in the broadcast, um, it's, it's, it's harder than you think. <clears throat> And many of the children, having arrived at this point, have told us already with their symptoms that it's not working at home. So I, my dialogue with you would be more about why. And is this the best thing for you and for the child? And could they be better served by not being at home? So I would be... I would be, have a healthy skepticism about that. My son is going on his third week at Evoke. My five-year-old daughter is asking where her brother is at. She is aware that he visits his father and assumes he is there. Do you have an answer for me to give to my five-year-old about what, where he really is at? I had this experience. When my son was 13 and 14, his siblings were... Nine, nine years younger. So his siblings were five. Um, and I would tell, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> Malia, mark that time, please. I, um, I would tell him the same thing, tell them that the same thing that I told my oldest son when I, when I explained my job, I would say he's gone camping to, help him deal with some sadness. He's in the mountains camping, um, learning how to be happy. I mean, it's that's a s simple way to say it, but my children grew up when they were young knowing that their father worked with sad boys and girls. And I think it's okay. Somebody asked me recently, in fact, the podcast will be coming out this week about um, my... Uh, my disclosure that I make about therapy, my children all the time. And I've checked with my children over the years, many, many times. And there's just no, we all go to therapy. Every one of us goes to therapy. We think it's kind of strange that people don't go to therapy. We kind of don't get those people. So it's just normal to have feelings and to struggle and to need help. So I would make it simple, but it's okay to say it. He's camping and learning how to be happy. Good question. Brings back some memories for me. How do you effectively detach yourself? Healthy detachment from your 15-year-old child. We've thought our child all, all their life 
who've taught our child all their life to rely on us and now they're struggling, we have to step back. I mean, it's a process, right? It's a, it's a natural process with children who don't struggle to kind of work through healthy detachment. But let, let, me, let me give you kind of a, a, a nice little thought I think that can be helpful. Healthy detachment is synonymous with healthy attachment. I'm going to say that again. Healthy detachment, a term coined by the recovery industry, is synonymous. It's the exact same thing as healthy attachment. Gandhi said that to love other as other, to love another's otherness, is to take on the heroic responsibility of one's own differentiation and own journey. To love other as other, we have to take on our own differentiation, our own separateness, our responsibility for our lives, our own journey. And he said this heroism may properly be called love. So what, what your children are teaching you, and you're being invited to lovingly detached. They're teaching you how to love them. They're teaching you that they are other. They're teaching you what it means to be an other. I've worked with clients who got into the work because a child that they love was struggling with mental health or addiction. And years later, they say to me, it all started with that. And, and now I know how to love in ways I didn't even know that I didn't know. I know how to love my partner. I know how to love my family of origin. I know how to love the people that I work with. They're just teaching you how to love. And it's painful. And that's why Gandhi calls it heroic. That's a, I wrote a, the chapter in my new book. I took that quote that I was pulling from just now. And I wrote the entire uh, chapter based on that one quote called Meaningful Love. It's just authentic, genuine, differentiated love that, that our children are unconsciously asking for, begging for, needing from us. What is Evoke's philosophy about transitioning the child, uh, transitioning the way the child depends on the therapist and looks to them as the authority to the parent when they come, when they're about to come home? Well, hopefully they, Huh, that's a good question. I was going to say, hopefully, the, the therapist isn't serving in an authoritative role, but, but that's not true. I, in some ways, they make decisions and they, they decide on boundaries and so forth. Um, I don't have any thoughts about that. I, I, think it's, I think it translates fairly well. And I think that the strength of your authority will be on, built on the strength of your vulnerability. The more work you do, you, you know, I, I've told a couple of people this week already, like, write a letter to your child saying, I'm starting to realize how much how screwed up I am. You know? Now, when I say that, some people say, well, that's going too far, and the child's going to use it against them. And, I, and my response is, they can't. Because I'm not telling you to compromise who you are. I'm telling you to admit that you're fallible. And now that your boundaries are coming from a place of self, and authenticity not being right. You know, the, the enlightened folks that have walked on planet Earth, they're not big on right and wrong. They're big on being imperfect and infallible. They will readily, continually talk about their fallibility. And when asked to compromise a value or, or a stance, they're unflappable. So the shift is from being an authority to being you, from being right to being a self. And if you can model being a self, then when somebody tries to peer pressure your child or they're in a, a relationship with a potentially toxic partner and somebody tries to pressure them, they'll say, I'm out. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not okay with this. And when that person tries to argue with them or, or talk them into it, they'll say, no, you don't understand. I grew up in a family where how I felt was enough. I didn't have to be right. So 
my 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 values and my my selfhood aren't open for debate. I'm just okay with being me. And you can think I'm crazy or wrong or stupid, but that's about you. What are some of the deciding factors on your clients to be able to have a phone call home? It's very diverse. Sometimes it's work. Sometimes it's a, a an accomplishment. We're trying to open up more and more and more. We want more and more phone calls as much as possible, especially during COVID because visits to the field are limited. So it's not one reason, and therefore there aren't one set of criteria. Sometimes I'll put a child on the phone who's struggling. Sometimes I'll put a child on the phone put a child on a phone to celebrate an accomplishment. So it varies widely and I constantly ask evoke therapists and you can tell them I said this to continue to expand it um, to include more opportunities for, for not just connection and celebration and warmth and love, but for work. Last question before I have to wrap up for this evening. My teen son is coming home from sober living out of state and we have discussed our expectations in regard to the shelter in place order. He expressed the need to meet people in person in order to complete his amends, regardless of our request to stay home. I don't know how to express my expectations without making him feel that I'm not fully supportive in his recovery. A part of me believes this is an excuse to see his friends. Um, I'm going to try to do this without swearing. <laughs> it's, it's nonsense. You don't have to see people in person to make an amends. There's, it's just nonsense. It's it's BS. You just hold your boundary and he gets to decide how he deals with it. And you're not going to, it's not disrespecting his recovery. There's a lot of things that we can't do right now. It stinks for all of us. My staff were discouraged about not being able to take vacations in between their very long shifts. And I was saying, I know it stinks. I'm missing out on so many things right now. So that's just nonsense. You don't have to argue. You don't have to be right. You just hold your boundary, and he has to decide how to deal with that boundary, how to respond to that boundary. All right, folks, if there are any leftover questions, I'll try to hold another one that's not too long from now. The Parent Support Group's Wednesday, May 6th, is the next Parent Support Group. Um, and then we have one Thursday, May 21st at 6 p.m. We're going to be doing these every week starting in June. Intensive support groups, um, Wednesday, May 27th, if you're an intensive alumni. All of these are via Zoom. Malia at evoketherapy.com for more information or for the links. We ask all parents to go to six 12-step support groups while their child is with us. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or adult children. Alateen is for teens. You, all, you can also go to Refuge Recovery. It's a Buddhist-inspired program with less of an emphasis on a higher power. The National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, is a great place to find resources in your area. All of these, all of these uh, broadcasts are available on your podcast app. Uh, our podcast name is Finding You at Evoke Therapy Pro Podcast. Please go to your favorite podcast app and subscribe, and they'll pop up when you have a new one. You can also go to sound, soundcloud.com on your computer to listen to any of these. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy. You can also find the Evoke Therapy Intensives program on Instagram using Evoke Therapy Intensives uh, handle. Search Evoke Therapy programs on Facebook. The Evoke Family Foundation raises money for people who can't afford therapy. They're also on Facebook. And the Evoke Therapy blog is there. My book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are both on Amazon right now. We have special COVID pricing as of today uh, that will last just a little while longer. So you can go in and buy copies or the ebooks there. Uh, audio books should be coming out um, in just a little while, hoping sooner rather than later, just having some editing done with that. I actually recorded it myself. Thank you for joining us this evening. We'll send out an invite for the next broadcast. I appreciate your investment. <coughs> Excuse me. For and in behalf of your child, thank you for showing up and being willing to take the heroic look inward Take care. I hope this is helpful. Have a great week. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.